By 1954, when the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde was terminated, less than 1% of the original 69,100-acre reservation granted by President Franklin Pierce's executive order in 1857 remained in Grand Ronde tribal ownership. Over the course of almost 100 years, the 27 Native American tribes and bands that comprised the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde slowly saw their land whittled away by deception, neglect, and colonial efforts to divest Indian peoples of their lands and their rights by state and federal governments. After 21 years of termination, all that remained was approximately five acres. But it was not always so. Members of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon descended from proud peoples who populated the vast territories of Western Oregon, Southwestern Washington, and Northern California before contact with white explorers and settlers occurred in the early 19th century. We were great um, tradesmen. We had great artistic ability. We had uh, a lot of commodities that other tribes desired. After initial contact with early white explorers and settlers, epidemic diseases swept through traditional homelands, decimating native tribal populations. The tribes that make up the Grand Ronde Confederation, Shasta, Rogue River, Umpqua, Molala, and Kalapuya signed seven treaties ceding their vast lands to the federal government in the 1850s. The native peoples were herded together and temporarily relocated to a reservation at Table Rock near present-day Medford, Oregon. But hostilities with local settlers and miners forced relocation under protective armed guard to the coast and Grand Ronde reservations. Tribal members were forced march 263 miles over 33 days in February and March of 1856 to Grand Ronde. Along the way, eight tribal members died and eight children were born. Despite being relocated to the supposed safety of the Grand Ronde Reservation, the assault on the tribe's way of life continued. In 1887, the Dawes Indian Allotment Act led to the loss of major portions of the reservation to non-Indian ownership. In 1901, U.S. Inspector James McLaughlin declared almost 26,000 acres of the reservation surplus and sold it for $1.16 per acre, reducing the reservation to a mere 440 acres. Much of the land was purchased by local timber interests. In 1936, the Indian Reorganization Act allowed the tribe to purchase land for subsistence and farming sites, and the reservation doubled in size to about 1,000 acres. But in 1954, Congress passed the Western Oregon Indian Termination Act, severing the trust relationship between the federal government and the tribe, ending all federal services two years later. Grand Ronde tribal members were no longer acknowledged as Indians by the federal government and other tribes and had no rights to the reservation lands. Termination was a final act in a series of decisions to divest Indian peoples and the tribes of their lands and rights. The interesting thing about termination for Oregon is that Governor McKay, who was governor of Oregon, became the Secretary of the Interior under Eisenhower. And Governor McKay had many, many friends in the timber industry. And it is my belief that it was timber. In particular, it was the Klamath, because Klamath had the largest stand of ponderosa pine in the world. So it's my belief that Klamath was the goal. And while we're at it, let's be a really active Secretary of the Interior and let's terminate everybody else in Oregon. As I understood it, that we were no longer the visible ones, we were invisible as far as the United States. And with that invisibility, we then had to work harder. We needed to represent our family and our people, that we were the ones who would remember. We are the ones who would carry out all of the possibilities that there were for us as a people. 
Termination was followed by a relocation program that encouraged Grand Ronde tribal members to leave the area. It was a devastating time for our family. It, it, I think it actually broke our family apart. The philosophy behind relocation was to destroy the kinships, break the ties mm -hmm. of tribes, intermix in marriage, and, and assimilate the into the dominant culture. If we uh, assimilate them out into the other uh, cultures, pretty soon they'll intermarry and intermarry and intermarry and there won't be Indians anymore and then we don't have any trust responsibility to them. It wasn't the easiest thing to go out there and, uh, and uh, intermix, but uh, it was hard uh, to be out there in the world trying to get a job and, uh, and locate where uh, we didn't make fun of your kids in school. Termination cut this tribe deep. It was, you know, a matter of non-existence. You know, it was, um, it, it was nothing short of a genocide in my eyes. Termination has been, well, along with the Allotment Act, probably the most destructive piece of legislation that the Congress has ever passed. For almost 20 years, Grand Round tribal members continued living as Indians in their homes and among their extended families, keeping the embers of traditional ways alive the best they could, despite not having formal recognition from the federal government. Tribal elder Eula Petit taught Chinook Wawa, while others, such as Jackie Whistler, held traditional craft classes out of her home. The annual Memorial Day celebration at the Tribal Cemetery continued to attract tribal members back home at least once a year. My dad had a disagreement with what they have, the jargon here and the jargon that he spoke, because our grandma was full-blooded, so she spoke jargon. And then Ivan spoke it a lot. Thanks, my man. uncle on the other side, of the, my mom's side, so. I remember one of the first times I heard it, I can't place a year, but. I was out at Framing Night, Framing A as we called it, lived out on Sourgrass, and right across the road, Uncle Gus, which would have been my great-great-uncle lived, and we, I went down there across the street with Grandpa to see Uncle Gus, and when we walked in the house, they started speaking it, and I had no idea what they were saying at the time. Finally, asking Grandpa what it was, it was jargon, and yeah. that's where we picked up small words from Grandpa over time. That's what I couldn't figure out growing up. I couldn't figure out why they always threw these words in there. And I'm like, why do we use, how come they just don't say, you know, they'd say Tillicum and they'd say, well, that's one of your family. They'd say, well, that's your Tillicum. Or that guy's pretty skookum or, you know, he's, you know, or how come you're so Tana today? And, you know, they, I'm like, how come we use different language and everybody else? <laughs> but they didn't, you know, nobody told us it was, a, you know, a, a, just, you learned it. People went around and visited them days, and as soon as the older folks would get together, they'd start talking to them, laughing and pointing at us. But we learned it down, actually, Grandma and Grandpa would have been my Uncle Russ's mom and dad, because Grandma made you speak it at the table. So if you couldn't speak it, you got pretty hungry. <laughs> My friends that I hung out with, they were, you know, they were enrolled and federally recognized, but since I was an Indian, they, it, they still embraced me, I guess, if you will. So I didn't let that stop me because my parents told me I was an Indian and that was good enough for me. I wasn't going to be deter uh, terminated. I was a, a, a person and a group of people, which is a tribe of people. So how can they take your identity away from you just by terminating you? That's the piece that we never changed. I mean, when we were terminated, we didn't just quit, you know, say we're, we're an Indian anymore. There used to be a huge thing here during Memorial Day, and they'd bring in dirt and mound the graves and do the cemetery, and it was, that's one of my things that it went on forever. In 1968, President Lyndon Johnson delivered a speech that repudiated the federal policy of termination and encouraged, along with President Richard Nixon, self-determination for Indian tribes. And in 1972, a small group of Grand Round tribal members, Marvin Kimsey, 
Margaret Provost and Merle Holmes began thinking about restoring the Grand Round Tribe after attending an Association of Urban Indians meeting in Lebanon, Oregon. I worked at Albany at Teledyne Wachang, and uh, it's a rare metal plant. And uh, there was a, a gentleman there by the name of Bob Cannon, and he and uh, another one by the name of Thurman Banks. <laughs> and uh, they were pretty interested in other tribes that were being restored. And he started talking to us about why it wasn't Grand Round and so forth. And, we didn't think too much about it, but he uh, had an uh, Indian organization started in Lebanon there, and and we started having meetings with them, and then they uh, then Bob got up with the idea, why didn't Grand Round seek restoration? And I said, well, nobody's done it. Well, what's the matter with you? <laughs> Their base of operation was a small shack without running water and electricity at the tribal cemetery. It was located on the only land, approximately five acres, officially left of the once large Grand Ronde Reservation. Their desire for tribal restoration was bolstered in 1973 when the Menominee Tribe in Wisconsin became the first terminated tribe restored by an act of Congress. In order to get termination overturned, you had to put in place something else. But what you also had to do was persuade the United States Congress they'd made a mistake a very tough thing to do. They don't think they make a mistake. That's what every restoration bill is. It's a, a, a recognition by the Congress that this wasn't the right thing to do and we're now writing this wrong. Well, it was Marv Kimsey's the one that got me involved. Because I was down to Kosen and I come up just to celebrate New Year's or Christmas and Marvin told me I was elected to council. And so I just, after the celebration, I saw the people thought enough of me, so maybe I better stick around and see what the hell's going on. Marvin and Margaret Provost and Marvin Kinsey, Merle Holmes wasn't there. And me and Margaret's Jackie Reimer, well, that was, anyway, Jackie Provost. So, and Margaret started talking about restoration. I thought, I, 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 I thought to myself, oh my God, could that really happen for us? Could that really, could that really, could that really be? I leave there like absolutely on fire with the belief that that could happen. It's kind of odd because people, you know, what, what does restoration mean? I mean, and I think there's a couple different ways to look at restoration. You have the people who weren't tribal or weren't before restoration who felt that now I'm gonna be recognized as an Indian. And you got people who lived here all their lives who never quit being an Indian. So for us, it was basically the government living up to their responsibilities finally. That's restoration meant to us. Everybody seemed like they were on board and, and the goals were the same at that time. Like mom said, the goals were the same. Everybody had the same goal. Everybody wanted to, we're heading toward restoration and come, you know, Heck or high water, we were going to arrive there. Funding for the restoration was almost non existent. An October 25, 1975 Treasurer's Report from Vicki Lawrence had a balance of $2.27 in the tribe's bank account. Fundraising became a community effort as children, adults, and elders held bake sales, car washes, and get togethers to raise money for postseason travel expenses. Tribal children spent days collecting huckleberries, which were turned into jam for roadside Indian fry bread stands. In the beginning, there was no pay, nothing. Right. They, they slept on pallets on the floor. Uh, they went door to door asking for support and asking uh, churches and asking for donations. It was a hard, hard, how many years? 11. You know, the, these people yeah. didn't get paid. This was something from the heart, from the passion of how they felt. I also remember the meetings that we had here. The general meetings were actually up at the, mostly up at St. Michael's. And my mom volunteered us a lot, and I tell people this story all the time. We were the dishwashers. <laughs> so um, general Pop meetings service. at that time were potlucks. There were no catered meals or anything right. like that, just potlucks. And um, we would be the dishwashers 
even Michael standing on a bucket or something so she could reach the big huge. I was gonna say I never got to go to DC. <laughs> I was the little one left at home with my dad. Making oh, I him chicken noodle see, soup out of the either. can. <laughs> <laughs> Which wasn't really easy, it, by the way. It wasn't you didn't even learn to do that until you were about 14. I was 13 at Restoration. Believe me, <laughs> leaving them home, home to take care of things was a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember the togetherness. You know, we all had that one goal, and everybody was focused on that goal, and it didn't matter for our bake sales or... You know, we were just a little handful of people. We'd buy each other's big sale. But the money was there when it was all over. And everybody just, just got along so well, I thought. Well, before restoration, we used to go to Stowe's Call. It was small tribes of Western Washington. Because they was pushing for us. Because, hell, we didn't have any money down here. But anyhow, we'd go up there, so then we'd get traveling money through Stowe. We had to have garage sales, rummage sales, car washes. Bottle drives. <laughs> Remember when Mom used to take us up on by South Lake and we used to pick huckleberries up? She'd take us up before work and drop, drop us off. off and come down to work and we'd be up there all day picking huckleberries so they could make jam to sell fry bread along the highway yeah. down by the store. Yeah, mm -hmm. see, and that was back in the good old days, you know, but there wasn't any money, but we were unified. I remember picking so huckleberries. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huckleberries. Like Do you know how long it takes to fill a gallon jar of huckleberries? <laughs> All day. <laughs> how long? All day. At least. <laughs> yes. At ten dollars a gallon, I thought I was gonna be rich. <laughs> I remember Jackie take yeah, Jackie took us up onto the reservation. Well, it wasn't the reservation then, but it is now. But I do remember Oh doing yeah, that. Mike and Doug telling me there were bears out there. I was just <laughs> trying to scare us. Who was telling you that? Mike and Doug Colton. Oh, those guys. Yes, we'd go up there. His dad would drop us off with our lunches, and we'd pick huckleberries all day, and they would tell me <laughs> stories. <laughs> we had a lot of support from our elders. They, they had oh, a bake yeah. sale every, every month when we'd have a meeting. meeting. They would bring pies, and if there weren't people to buy there in the meeting to buy it, they'd buy from each other to raise money for us to have gas money and postage. With restoration, I've, I've been hearing stories that my grandmother, Esther Labonte, Esther Mary Jones, uh, she was born in 1897, mm -hmm. and she passed away in 1987. And before our tribe was restored, uh, I hear stories that she used to uh, pick vegetables at a farm, uh, tomatoes and things like that. And whatever little money she made, she would donate like $15 or so for the cause of the tribe to get recognized again. That was really um, a joint um, effort for all of those who were interested. You did what you had to. You stepped out of your comfort zone and you wrote letters, made TV appearances. You did whatever you had to do to make sure that the message was out there and that people were aware of the plight of the Grand Ron Indian people. Back in 1981, I interviewed for a job at the state capitol and I got hired there. I was working for uh, Hardy Myers who was the speaker of the house at the time. Oh, I remember Marvin was there. Uh, I think Jackie was there, Catherine, Merle and I kind of you know just kind of made them feel comfortable and uh, let them know that uh, I could kind of probably help them out because uh, being working there and knowing the state representatives and the senators and working with them it kind of you know how to get things done seeing them there and their smiling faces and their energetic way about them uh, I really knew that they wanted to you know accomplish something that they were really in, involved in this and I knew they had a definitely uh, intimidating task ahead of them Tribal members educated the surrounding community about the inherent justice of restoration, elicited support from other Oregon tribes, 
and enlisted the congressional support of Congressman Lessa Coyne and Senator Mark Hatfield. So I had to be fairly blunt with them. They needed to tell the story locally. They did their job fabulously well and came back with just an incredible amount of support. We eventually had to say, all we want is our piece of pie back. When we got terminated, you know, your piece of pie got bigger. All we want is our piece of pie back. So then along with that, with the other outside organizations, you know, they say, we're not asked for a hand up. We're asked for our piece of pie back. Mm -hmm. And I think that explained it better than, other than, you know, we want to take our rightful place in the family of Indian nations. And we've done that. But we had to educate the community, the county, state. and the state. All that had to be done before we could have went, and that's the part that we worked on before we went for, to federal recognition. And this was all volunteer. It's just, you know, what we believed in, and we lived it. In October 1983, Marvin Kimsey, Jackie Whistler, Catherine Harrison, her son Frank Harrison and daughter Karen Askins traveled to Washington, D.C. to testify before the House of Representatives about restoring the Grand Ronde tribe. When we finally uh, went to the, uh, what was then called the and it's the Subcommittee on Indian Affairs, it's now in the Natural Resources Committee, when the tribe testified, they testified on the issue of justice. They testified on the issue that they wanted to once more join the family of Indian nations to work together with other Indian nations to support uh, tribal programs and tribal people. And it was a very impressive uh, testimony. After the House and Senate passed the bill, it was sent to President Ronald Reagan, who on November 22nd, 1983, signed it into law. I remember the excitement in Mom's voice. And she called and said, we got restored. And uh, I remember getting shivers, getting the chills. And, but still not really comprehending exactly what that meant. Restoration Day was wonderful. When we got news that President Reagan had signed you know, the Restoration Act, we gathered at the cemetery building. There was like about 30 or 40 of us in there. We were hugging each other, we were yahooing. That's the only place we had. But I'll tell you, that was one of the happiest days of my life. What was your response when you heard? Pretty big yahoo. Yahoo. We waited quite a while, and I think, I believe it came in the evening. And when we got that phone call, we all just started yelling and cheering, and, <laughs> and that's about the extent of a the, we, uh, of our uh, elation that, that, that that happened and that we knew that it was signed into effect finally and I, I really felt really supportive of those people that actually worked on it. I mean they worked hard and they made several DC trips and, and uh, um, put out, they worked on grants and stuff before that and uh, I just felt very supportive of them and uh, there was uh, three people that were very instrumental in getting the, the uh, restoration effort started and that was uh, Marv Kimsey, Merle Holmes and Margaret Provost. You just felt a lot of uh, gratitude to them for all of their hard work. The tribe was restored and the work of rebuilding a nation began. In 1984, the first official post-restoration tribal council was sworn into office. Council members were Catherine Harrison, Dean Masseer, Candy Robertson, Frank Harrison, Daryl Masseer, Mark Masseer, Russ Lino, Merle Lino, and Henry Petit. Four years later, in 1988, President Reagan signed the Grand Ronde Reservation Act into law, returning almost 10,000 acres of the original reservation to the tribe. In 1989, the tribe purchased 5.5 acres along Highway 18 and three years later finished building the Tribal Community Center, the first permanent building constructed since restoration. In 1994, 
tribal membership voted to pursue gaming as a revenue source and use the land it had purchased on Highway 18 on which to build Spirit Mountain Casino, which opened in October 1995. With a firm financial base, the tribe began building its membership services and rediscovering its cultural heritage in leaps and bounds. In 1996, both the Grand Round Tribal Housing Authority and Timber Trust Fund were established, and the Tribal Health and Wellness Clinic opened in 1997. Also in 1997, the tribe's first housing development, Grand Meadows, was completed. And resurrecting the native tradition of potlatch, the tribe created Spirit Mountain Community Fund, which distributes 6% of the casino's profits to worthy charitable organizations and causes in 11 Western Oregon counties. In October 1998, the Governance Center opened and Spirit Mountain Lodge welcomed its first guests. In 1999, Tribal Council passed the Gaming Revenue Allocation Plan. The tribe opened its first elder housing complex in 2000 and opened a new education complex in 2002. In recent years, the tribe has built three foster care units to house and support tribal elders, opened tribal housing for both low-income and market-rate rental units for tribal members, and regained sovereignty rights to hunt for ceremonial game. The tribe built the West Valley Veterans Memorial, a tribute to area residents, tribal and non-tribal, who have served in the military. The fourth expansion of Spirit Mountain Casino opened in May 2008. Spirit Mountain Casino has become the largest employer in Polk and Yamhill counties, and more and more tribal members are attaining self-sufficiency by working for tribal, governmental, and commercial enterprises. So I spent 12 years on almost half of that time on tribal council and it's been a whirlwind uh, and I think it's great for the membership. The tribe continues to build an even stronger nation at the silver anniversary of restoration. A tribal elder activity center is nearing completion on the tribal campus. Annually the tribe hosts two major powwows and a rodeo. The tribe is a good steward of its natural resources ensuring tribal wildlife habitat is healthy and maintained. I see the, you know, huge opportunities for this tribe to be a leader in the area, especially something that's very close to my heart, the environment. I, I think we can make a uh, huge impact on the quality of life of all Oregonians. Culturally, the tribe has recaptured much of its heritage. A traditional plank house will be built on the new powwow grounds near Fort Yam Hill State Park. And planning is underway on building a cultural center museum to proudly display tribal culture and be an interpretive facility on Grand Ronde history and traditions. Tribal members are learning traditional arts and crafts, such as making hand drums and baskets, as well as how to make their own powwow regalia. Restoration for me really means the revitalization of our culture. We as a, as a Indian tribe, not an organization or a club. We are a nation of people. And so for me it was uh, the cultural part of our uh, restoration. Overall, I, I think it's got us to uh, um, place in our history where we can, we can uh, afford the luxury of, of trying to bring back our culture. Because 30 years of termination, you know, was devastating to our culture. I know that we need to really revitalize our culture because to me that's the main stay in our identity and showing people who we are what we stand for, and just our own ability to be able to share in the things that make us who we are and to, to realize the importance of it. Tribal youth are also participating in the Tribal Canoe Family and the annual Canoe Journeys, as well as dancing in Tribal powwows. I believe that with new leadership 
leadership and new generations, there's a lot in store for the future of our tribe and that with the youth and with leadership, things can go really far. I see it going in a good, good way because we got, you know, we got our canoe family here for the kids. We were getting close to retirement and we both knew we were going to come home which Grand Ronde is home. This is where we was raised. My feelings about where we've been and where we're going as a tribe has been very positive. Um, I really want to see us do more as a community. So as the young, the old, we're all in it together like it was when we were kids. I am part of the health committee. I do help the elders. I am honored anytime I'm asked to do something for the tribe because I've received so much from them that anything I can do to give back is very important. 25 years after restoration, the Grand Ronde tribe is economically, culturally, and socially strong a tight-knit family of tribal families, and the Grand Round Tribe is looking to grow stronger in the 21st century while continuing to care for its growing membership, employees, surrounding communities, and other Oregon tribes. Tribal leadership has passed on to a new generation of tribal members. Their passion and unwavering commitment to improving the lives of Grand Round tribal members and guaranteeing that the tribe will never relive its past reflects the same passion and commitment of those who worked on the restoration more than 25 years ago. When restoration happened, it was like, what a relief for uh, the gener my generations and those that are from me that I don't even know about how how important this is for them to be born into a tribe of people uh, to know that they belong that they're not outcasts because that's kind of what we were we're not not out they're not going to be outcasts as we have been and they'll be able to go on into the future and our people will survive. That's, for me, that's what it meant. If I had to look at a legacy, I'd want to look at the legacy that I, when all the time I spent on council was about keeping our tribe together as a family. I think that's what makes you different than a corporation or any other businesses, tribes or family. As a tribe, even though we were 27 different tribes and bands, at termination, we were one family. At uh, restoration, we became one family again, even though we were spread all over the United States and the world, we became one family again. And uh, uh, during the termination years, we were still a family. And I think that's, you know, all your decision making needs to be based around that we are a family. I think there's a perception, and this is very human, that, oh gosh, it must have been easy, it could have been done any time, because it happened. Not true. The, at every moment, that, could have, that bill could have failed. The effort could have failed. And um, the bill that finally passed was a bill that was as good as it was ever going to get. The council were very clear on what their priorities were, and they were very clear in listening to what the congressman and the senator told them was possible. Um, politics is the art of the possible. And it's no good saying, oh, we want everything if we're not going to get everything, if we're not going to get anything as a result of that. They, in fact, um, I think this, that council needs to be honored by their, by the descendants because they did the impossible. Grand Ron had nothing. Nothing. They had no land, they had this little tiny room, they had no economic development opportunities, and they took the very best they could get and, and, and have made it better. And I just hope the tribal members will understand that, uh, that 
They were magnificent, those, that council. Well, I should never forget that their elders uh, dared to dream, they dared to believe that they could take on the forces of prejudice locally for succeeding generations of Grand Rock tribal members. I hope they'll remember, first and foremost, the, the courage and the tenacity and the brilliance of the effort of their, of their elders to make life better for, for them. I would say that after 25 years, um, the, the tribe, we've, we've had our ups and downs, but I really believe that all the members of this tribe, all of us have had our lives improved by being a part of this tribe. The dream of becoming an educated Indian and giving back to my community and my tribe, restoration has afforded um, that for me and um, has afforded my children a, an education and and to grow up in their the tribal environment is, is really important. It was very important to me. It was then and it is today and I have grandchildren. I get choked up. I have grandchildren and it's important for me to have them down here and for them to be a, a part of um, the tribal family. Um, I think without restoration, I'm not sure if as many tribal families that live down here today would be living here. Actually in the late 90s and we all three received help from the tribe to receive those degrees and which is great but I remember writing essays to apply for scholarships and um, you know telling my life story and telling what I want to do in the future and the tribe was always involved always involved I remember when we received scholarships we you know we were asked are you going to give back to your tribe how are you going to do that and our answers were always, we're going to work for the tribe. We don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to be here for the tribe like they've been here for us. As an educated tribal member that came back, I never thought that I never would. So I guess that's, growing up here, I never had a place, I guess, that I would choose to live other than here. So it was kind of, you know, the benefits of the tribe being restored, helping me get my education. I was just figured I would come back because this is where I wanted to actually raise my kids. It's a quarter of a century uh, being restored and, and uh, you know, uh, the United States government's only been around for 200 plus years. Uh, you know, it'll be amazing to see where we're at in 200 years. Uh, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we're all very, we're, everyone, we're all blessed being able to be American. Uh, or, you know, those tribal members were doubly blessed because we're also a part of another uh, 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 state or a nation. Uh, in the tribe. Gosh, there's just so much involved in becoming restored and and how much we've gained and saw it in you know, such a, a short amount of time because I think that we really were fortunate to become as successful as we are in the, the amount of time that it's happened. I think it uh, made me a better person um, uh, health-wise. It's helped me and my family I shudder to think what mm -hmm. would be happening to us now if we didn't have our, our health um, program. I just can't imagine where my family would be at without the programs that have been available to us. What really what I want to see as an ep and I'm an elder now is, is that that footprint is so deep that there's no question of who we are, where we were from our history, our culture, and that uh, we are out there and people know who we are. I'm very thankful. Did you ever think it would be this way? No, I didn't. Well, I actually wouldn't trade it for nothing. You would? I wouldn't trade the restorations, fight. From a small maintenance shed at the tribal cemetery on only five acres to a restored reservation, popular casino, health clinic, governance center, and other structures and business enterprises, as well as a resurgent culture and heritage. The Confederated Tribes of Grand Round have risen from the ashes of termination to blossom again as a restored Indian tribe, a vibrant, culturally rich, and economically sound native community that will celebrate restoration seven generations into the future. The reason that we kept coming together was to honor our dead. 
so I believe that they are still there. The wisdom of our elders are still there guiding us. I think one of the real strengths that the Grand Ronde people has is that we know that the, our destiny is in our hands. We no longer want to be in the position where someone else has the key to whether, our, whether we survive or not. That's, that's of the past. We will determine our own destiny. I'm a firm believer in that.